These are the spiders in your house. Hello again, YouTube. Now, a lot of you have asked for a video about the giant house spider. And others have asked for a video about the hobo spider. So I set out to tackle one and realized that you can't really talk about one without talking about the other for reasons that will become clearer as we go. And somewhere in there comes the barn funnel weaver, which I think I've also been asked about. So I'll be talking about three different species this time. It's technically more than that, but let's go with three for now. So because there's a lot to cover, I'm going to do this video in two parts. In this part, I'll get into the relationships between these spiders, how to identify them, how they perceive the world and hunt, and I'll touch on their bite, the history of their reputations, and the mystery surrounding the fate of one of the prominent researchers of these spiders over 20 years ago, which remains a mystery. All that is coming up. Let's introduce the spiders, shall we? So this is a giant house spider. This one's name is Tupi, and he was obtained for me by Jennifer McKay, so thank you so much, Jennifer and family. We can tell he's a male by these enlarged ends on the pedipalps here. This is not only a spider a lot of people have, but one that a lot of people notice, because they get pretty big, they're notoriously quick, and they can be a little scary looking. And here we have Harriet, a female, who I found in the rocks on a waterfront here in Nova Scotia. And this big guy is Gary, who suddenly appeared in my neighbor's living room. He can certainly make one understand why these spiders can scare the pants off a person when they show up without warning. This is Patricia, and she's a barn funnel weaver. I found her in my own basement while my mother-in-law was visiting us. So this is a species I do actually have in my house. And here's Harley, another barn funnel weaver, who was found for me by Alicia Strong. Thank you very much. And here's a hobo spider. Now, I couldn't get my hands on one as they don't occur where I live. I'm looking into procuring one or two of these for part two so I can have some more photos and video of them for you. But at the moment, I'm relying on borrowed material. If you live in North America or Europe, you've almost definitely encountered at least one of these three species of spider. Researching these presented a lot of interesting stories and a few mysteries. These three species are all pretty closely related, but exactly how closely is part of the mystery, as is the question, do I need to worry about any of them? But before I dive into it, I want to acknowledge the people who helped make this video possible. So a huge thanks to Catherine Scott and Sean McCann, Jeff Oxford, Rick Vetter, Jennifer McKay and family, Alicia Strong, Troy and Lisa Lightfoot, and of course, to all the viewers who have been liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing, this channel is growing because of folks like you doing what you're doing. So thank you. And also, a huge shout out to my patrons. Thank you so much for your support. You have been amazing. If you're interested in supporting the channel, the Patreon page is a great way to do that, and you get some extra content there as well. And a big thank you to my wife, who puts up with spiders in containers all over the house, and who has supported me in this whole YouTube endeavor. All of you are a part of making this video and this channel possible. Thank you so much. Now, I usually cover one species at a time in a video, and after the False Widow video, I swore I'd never try to cover a whole genus at once ever again. Why then am I covering three different spiders in this video? Well, as you can see, these three spiders are pretty similar. As a group, they're sometimes referred to as house spiders. But that's not a very helpful term, as you've got other spiders like the common house spider or the southern house spider, which are completely different spiders in completely different families. But there is a close relationship between these three. Because until recently, they all belonged to the same genus, Tegenaria. Now, genus is the last level of classification before actual species. So, for instance, a white-tailed deer and a mule deer are two different species in the same genus. A moose, however, is in a different genus, but belongs to the same family as those deer. And it's still kind of like a deer. So, these spiders are very similar to each other in both appearance and behavior. But how then did only one of them end up being regarded as super dangerous and only in one part of the world? Should we worry about the others too? Or should we stop worrying about the one? What's actually different about them? And how would you tell them apart? To address all of that, you sort of have to look at them together, side by side. 
So that's why I'm doing all three here. Now back in 1958, good old W.S. Bristow had some characteristically entertaining words about them in his famous work, The World of Spiders. He writes, Many people do not have to simulate fear when they see a long-legged house spider in possession of the bath or running over the floor of the sitting room, and Sax Romer, the novelist, once wrote to the Daily Express, saying that he had overcome his horror by eating one. I have eaten a house spider without having the same success. The situation in which I found myself was this. An invitation to play cards after a good dinner, no money in my pockets, a specimen of tea domestica walking across the drawing room carpet. And the consequences? A bet to eat the spider and the amount of my winnings increased at cards by 1100% by the end of the evening. Conclusions. That spiders are lucky, but that a horror of house spiders cannot be cured by eating one. Well, that answers that, I guess. He points out that they're great sprinters, but poor endurance runners. Provided a full-grown Tegenaria is impelled with the end of a pencil to run at top speed without any pause whatever, she collapses in a state of prostration in less than 20 seconds, whereas some relatively slow-moving small spiders with body lengths of 2.5 millimeters are still well embarked on a marathon after three quarters of an hour when I myself am exhausted by my part in the proceedings. Bristow is the most delightful spider writer ever. Now, this book is long out of print, but if you can find a copy, it's well worth it. Anyhow, all of these spiders remained in the same genus until 2013, when Angelo Boltzern, Daniel Burkhardt, and Andros Hanji in Switzerland took a good look at the genus and realized it was kind of a mess. So they did a bunch of sciencing, which involved looking closely at the physical traits of the spiders, like the spine pattern on the legs, spinneret structures, chelicerol teeth, and, of course, genitals. They also examined mitochondrial DNA to look for similarities. From that, they constructed phylogenetic trees, the diagrams of how we think organisms descended and diverged from common ancestors. And they found that there was a clear break between some spiders in the Tegenaria genus and other ones. So it made sense to create a new genus that was distinct from Tegenaria. What shall we call this new genus, they thought. Well, as we all know scientists do, they surely followed some kind of rules that strictly govern these scientific names and chose something laden with meaning that only Greek and Latin language nerds could decipher, right? They just mixed up the letters. But why not? We have spiders now with species names like Roddenberrius Spock, in tribute to Star Trek, and Venomius Tom Hardyi, honoring the actor who plays the Marvel anti-hero Venom. I'm not kidding, these are real scientific names of real spiders now. But I mean, there's 50,000 species of spiders in the world that we know of, and we keep finding more. We're gonna run out of Latin words eventually, so we may as well have some fun with it. Now, Splitting these spiders off into a new genus made sense, and had good scientific backing behind it. And the hobo spider and the giant house spider got placed in this new genus, while the barn funnel weaver remained back in Tegenaria. But the term giant house spider actually referred to three different species of spider, which, after the name change on the genus, should have been Eratogena atrica, Eratogena duelica, and Eratogena seva. And if you've ever tried to research giant house spider, you've probably come across two or three of these names and wondered, well, which one do I have? It might comfort you to know that even scientists have a hard time telling them apart sometimes, so for your purposes, it probably doesn't much matter. But Boltzern and his team studied these spiders quite a lot to figure out this new genus. They realized that when you looked at some of the structures under a microscope, having the part of the spider you were examining oriented just slightly differently could make the feature look significantly different. So that seemed unreliable. So they turned to examining mitochondrial DNA. That too failed to reliably differentiate these three supposedly different giant house spiders. So they theorized that the three had really been one species all along, published a paper on it, and thus the Eratogena genus was born and at the same time, three species of giant house spider were officially rolled into one. 
But then Jeff Oxford from York University in England read their paper and was sort of astonished at what they were suggesting. Since in England, where he was, there seemed to be an obvious East-West divide in the distribution of E. duelica and E. seva, and to him E. atrica had always been pretty easy to distinguish by examination. So he got in touch with Angelo Bolzern, and you can imagine how that went. I dispute your sciencing. I dispute your disputing my sciencing. You can't do that. I can and I did. Ah! I'm kidding, it was nothing like that. Oxford pointed out that there was a real discrepancy between what he could observe in England and what Bolzern and his team had observed in Switzerland. So the two of them teamed up to figure out what was going on with these spiders. They revisited the physical features, taking a bunch of measurements of spiders from Britain, continental Europe, and North America using precise orientation techniques. And they plugged all of those measurements into a kind of algorithm called a principal component analysis. Now you have to be a linear algebra nerd to really understand how principal component analysis works, but the short version is that it's a way of looking at sets of variables, the differences between the sets, and sort of positioning them in a way that shows overall similarity or difference. And the advantage to it is that the math doesn't know what species of spider we think a set of measurements belongs to. It just puts it on a graph wherever the data directs it to be. When they did this, they found that all of these spiders clustered pretty convincingly into three distinct groups, and those groups just happened to coincide with the three distinct species we originally recognized. When they did the DNA analysis, though, they found that the difference between the species genetically was actually smaller than the genetic differences we often see between individuals of the same species. But that has been seen before, between species that are clearly distinct. A likely explanation for this is occasional and past hybridization. Now the three species have slightly differently shaped genitalia, which prevents them from interbreeding. Most of the time. But it occasionally happens, and while the resulting hybrid spider usually ends up mating with another purebred spider down the line, and their descendants might look like just one of the parent species, a genetic marker is left from the other making these different species look more or less the same genetically. So in the end, Oxford and Bolzern agreed that it would be more correct to treat giant house spiders as three distinct species, not just as one. As for the hobo spider, it too was given the bump from the Tegenaria genus into the Eratogena genus. So the hobo became known as Eratogena agrestis, rather than its old name, Tegenaria agrestis. And we should talk about that agrestis part for a minute. Before it became commonly known as the hobo spider, many people called this species the aggressive house spider, including some researchers. But most research has considered these spiders as quite timid and unlikely to bite. The perception of them as aggressive may be related to a common misinterpretation of the Latin moniker agrestis, a name given to it from the very beginning when Walkenayer first identified this spider as a species all the way back in 1802. The Latin word agrestus has nothing to do with aggression, and actually translates to of the field. Of course, knowing what the Latin means isn't much help if we don't know what spider we have in front of us. So how do we identify and differentiate these spiders? First, while people's minds immediately jump to brown recluse whenever they see any brownish spider, all three of these spiders have a couple of features that immediately identify them as not brown recluses. The most obvious is this patterning on the abdomen. Now here's a brown recluse. Note all of the markings that there aren't on the abdomen. Recluses have basically blank abdomens, so if you see markings or patterns at all, it's not a recluse. None of these have the famous violin mark that recluses are known for. Instead, these spiders have two dark patches that sort of radiate to either side. And if you're still not convinced, or if the markings are faint, the eye pattern will give it away if you can get in close with a magnifying glass. All three of these house spiders have eight eyes in two rows, a pretty common arrangement. These eight eyes don't tell you what the spider is, but they do tell you what it's not. Because a brown recluse has six eyes in three pairs, which is notably different. 
So if you know what to look for, it's actually very easy to rule out brown recluse as a possible ID for any of these three species. So once you've eliminated recluse as an ID, let's get into identifying them as what they are. All three of these spiders belong to the family Agalenidae, which are the funnel web weavers. So if you find a spider in a web that looks like this, a sheet that turns into a little funnel-shaped cave, it's probably in this family. You'll see long spinnerets, though they sometimes sort of fold these over. There will be some patterning on the abdomen, which we'll get into in a minute. And they have eight eyes, all roughly the same size, in two rows, with the rear row sort of curving above the front row. Now this is how we know this isn't a wolf spider or a fishing spider, two spiders that could be confused with these. The eyes are a giveaway. These spiders have fine hairs on almost every part of their body, which gives them a more matte appearance. So if you've got shiny parts, especially a shiny abdomen, then it's definitely something else. They're pretty much all brownish, though the coloration can range quite a bit. Sean McCann and I once found this giant house spider that was almost completely black. But that's definitely not typical. Most spiders in the Agalinity family will have all of these features. So, how do we narrow it down to being one of these three? Well, this abdominal patterning is a pretty good start. All three of these have chevron-like markings that sort of run across the abdomen in sort of a stacked row. A near look-alike to these spiders is the Agalinopsis genus, known as the grass spiders, and they behave in much the same way and make the same kinds of webs, so they're easily confused. But grass spiders often have more of what looks like two rows of markings going down either side. Grass spiders also have really long, tapered, pointy spinnerets that usually look really close together. These spiders do have long spinnerets, but not quite as long, and usually a little more spaced out. And the markings on the prosoma are generally sort of feathery, radiating out from the center. They don't look like a pair of defined dark stripes running down either side of the prosoma like they do on this grass spider. So how do we tell these three apart? Well, this can be tricky, because they're all pretty similar. If you're in Europe, geography will be next to useless, because all three of these occur pretty much all over Europe. But if you're in North America, it's a good starting point. If you're south of Colorado, further north than the northern end of Vancouver Island, or east of Wyoming, then it's almost certainly not a hobo spider. Unless you live in southern Ontario, because they've been recently introduced there. Lucky you, Toronto! If you're nowhere near either coast, it's most likely not a giant house spider, as they occur only in these areas on the west coast and a little bit in the Maritimes. The barn funnel weaver, however, is widespread across basically all of the United States and Mexico, and the southern areas of Canada. So, the barn funnel weaver is the one most North Americans will be familiar with. It's also in Colombia, Ecuador, and Argentina down in South America, and they've been recorded in New Zealand and Australia too. Again, Europeans, you've likely encountered all three spiders. So, if you're in a place that's home to more than one of these spiders, they can be a little tricky to distinguish visually. Now, one of our first differentiators between these three is going to be the legs. The barn funnel weaver, Tegenaria domestica, is the only one of the three that has banded legs. This banding can be faint, but a good trick to check for is to take a photo of the spider, then play with the contrast settings to see if anything shows up. Thank you Tam McKenzie for that tip. Next, put the spider in a nice clear container like a glass and wait for it to put its belly up against the side. If you see light spots near the base of each leg on the sternum, then you know it's not a hobo spider. A hobo spider has a light stripe down the middle of the sternum, but it doesn't have these light spots. The giant house spider and the barn funnel weaver both do. Now, these markings can be faint too, so again, positively IDing these can be a bit of a trick, but if you see the spots, you're down to giant house spider or barn funnel weaver and then you can check for the banded legs of the barn funnel weaver. Now this process isn't bulletproof, as there are other spiders that are close relatives or that have very similar features, but this should get you pretty close, and I highly recommend checking out some of the online communities like iNaturalist, Bug Guide, or some of the spider Facebook groups. There are a lot of knowledgeable people in communities like that who can help you out if you can post a good photo. 
So now that we've got an idea how to figure out these spiders, how do these spiders figure out their world? Like most spiders, these spiders' eyes are nearly useless. They may be able to distinguish between light and dark, but that's probably about it. So they need a different arsenal of senses to make their way in life. One of these is chemoreceptors, fine hairs along the surfaces of the legs that allow the spider to detect different substances, essentially smelling or tasting objects they can touch. It's like having your taste buds on your fingers and toes. They'll usually touch prey quickly with their front legs to be sure that it's actually prey before delivering a bite. Now, some of these hairs also detect air currents, which can alert the spider to moving objects that it may not be able to see or touch. This sensitivity to motion is perhaps their most valuable sense, as they use their silk as an extension of their senses. And that brings us into how these spiders hunt. The Agilinidae family is known as the funnel web weavers, not to be confused with the Sydney funnel web spider, which is actually a totally different family, because their webs look like this, a sort of sheet of densely woven strands with a funnel at one end. This funnel is where the spider spends most of its time, and the sheet functions like an elaborate system of trip wires that all end in that funnel. As soon as something touches the sheet, the spider knows it. Now, Unlike orb webs, which function sort of similarly, these funnel webs are not sticky, meaning the prey isn't going to be there long, so these spiders have to rely on speed. Going back to Bristow, he writes that the giant house spider can cover a distance equivalent to 330 times its body length in 10 seconds, meaning that if you made it human-sized, it could give an Olympic sprinter a head start of 8.5 seconds and still beat them in a 100-yard dash. Let's have a look at what this looks like. So Harriet here has woven a network of threads all over this enclosure that sits just a few millimeters above the ground. Let's see what she does when I drop a fly onto the web. Well, that didn't take her long at all. Let's see that slowed down. Now this footage is a little dark, but here's the fly and here's the spider. Every time the fly moves, Harriet homes in on where exactly it is because she can sense those vibrations through the web. She has to reorient once or twice, but it doesn't take her long to grab it. And you can see that she has no problem running along this web. Here's Patricia, the barn funnel weaver, as I drop a cricket into her enclosure. Now she's got the same sheet woven over the bottom of this enclosure. That's not a lot of time to detect, identify, position, seize, and bite this cricket. She sort of panicked and retreated when I moved the enclosure for a better shot, but a few seconds later, she came back to the cricket and started dragging it into her funnel. But how does the spider run so quickly along the sheet, while insects struggle to move on it? Well, it turns out, despite the fact that spiders put their feet down at a near vertical angle on the web, they don't sink into it, due to the feathery hairs called plumose hairs on their legs that keep their feet from sinking in. In contrast, most insects put their legs on the sheet web in a flat manner, which maximizes contact and creates an adhesive effect, despite the silk itself not being sticky. Most funnel weavers will respond to any vibrating thing on their web, and that's what this is for. You can make one of these for cheap. Just get a cheap electric toothbrush from the drugstore and zip tie something floppy, like this length of tubing, to the end. Then turn it on and gently touch a sheet web with it. If the spider is home, more often than not, it will eventually run out to check out what it is. So these spiders use vibration and these chemoreceptors as their primary tools for hunting. Together with that sheet web, which functions as an extension of their senses, and this sheet web can sometimes cover a significant area, so it's a big advantage. What does the life cycle of these spiders look like? Well, hobo spiders mate in the fall, and the egg sacs overwinter, then hatch in the spring, the spiderlings grow through the summer, overwinter again, then mature the following year and mate that fall. So from hatching to mating takes about two years. Giant house spiders, once again, have to be more complicated than that. A study done by Samantha Viber et al. in 2017 looked at hobo spiders and giant house spiders on the west coast of British Columbia. 
Those giant house spiders mated in the fall, laid egg sacs, and the eggs hatched just a few weeks later. Then those spiderlings overwintered, grew through the following spring and summer, matured in the fall, mated, and made their own egg sacs. So hatching to mating was around a year. Turns out, that's not how they do it in Britain. According to Dr. Jeff Oxford, British giant house spiders mate in the fall but don't lay egg sacs until the spring, and the spiderlings emerge about a month later, growing through that year, and overwinter again, not maturing until the following August or September. So those ones have a two-year life cycle, like North American hobo spiders, males living a total of about 18 months and females living about two and a half years. Full of surprises, these spiders are. Anyway, both of those two species tend to be more common outdoors than indoors, and it's in the fall that males start to roam around. And this is when you're likely to find them in your house, as they wander into warmer places. The barn funnel weaver is a bit of a different story. Now, these spiders are found more inside buildings than outdoors, and so they can be found at basically any life stage, any time of the year. Seasons don't matter quite so much to them. Typically, the males live about a year, but there's this PDF that I think originates from Colorado State University saying that females have been reported living up to seven years in captivity. But there's no name on this, no cited source, so that's difficult to verify. And by the way, this is the PDF that Wikipedia cites as its source for the same claim. But being more of an indoor species, they don't have quite the same seasonal life cycle. And when it comes to mating, it's a familiar story for all three of these. Females sit in their comfy webs, which they lace with pheromones, while the males go out roaming, trying to find them. And when they do, then there's some leg tapping and some web plucking. Then the female goes sort of unresponsive if she's up for it, and the male drags her back into her own retreat, where the magic happens. After that, the males don't live much longer. And the female will make an egg sac in her retreat with anywhere from 40 to 100 eggs in it. And when they hatch, the spiderlings will stay with mom for a couple of days and then run off. Now, a lot of spider babies do what's called ballooning, letting out a strand of silk for the wind to catch, then riding the breeze to disperse to new places and start their independent lives. Like at the end of Charlotte's Web, right after the part we all cried at. Yes, you did. Don't lie. Orb weavers and a lot of other spiders really do this, but these spiders don't, meaning they don't get too far from where they hatch before they establish their own webs and settle. So this is a part of why they seem to have limited and relatively stable distributions. That said, they do get carried around by us sometimes, which is probably how the hobo spider got to southern Ontario. As humans, we've got no one but ourselves to blame. Or thank, I guess, depending on how you feel about hobo spiders. Of course, many of you are wondering about the bite. So I'll start with the giant house spiders, as visually these tend to be the most intimidating. Here's Gary, who's a pretty good sized spider, and with not much prodding, he just sort of crawled right onto my hand. Despite being capable of sprinting like the Flash, he seemed pretty chill with the whole situation. Now, I did this for about three minutes or so, and in that whole time, he showed no interest in biting me. At one point here, I actually even screwed up and sort of pinched his leg between my two hands, and I didn't notice until he sort of tapped on my hand with one of his other legs, like, hey, you're on my toe here, man. So I let go, and he just sort of carried on politely like things were all good. But bites from these species have been recorded, generally when the spiders were getting pinched or squished before the person noticed. Now, the confirmed cases that we have generally involved a stinging sensation weaker than that of a wasp sting, a small red mark on the skin, and very slight swelling that resolved within a few hours. So even if you manage to get bitten, these aren't going to do much harm, and that has never been disputed. Now, none of these three species that fall into the same Eratogena atrica group, the ones we call giant house spiders, has ever been implicated in a medically serious bite. Now, what about our barn funnel weaver, Tegenaria domestica? Well, it's much the same story with this one. The only confirmed cases I could find caused a bit of redness and stung a bit. So, if these two species, both very closely related to the hobo spider, are harmless, what happened with the hobo 
to give it the reputation it got. How did it end up in medical literature on the same level as the brown recluse, but only in North America? Well, this started in 1986, when arachnologist Darwin K. Vest noticed increasing rates of what was called necrotic arachnidism, skin lesions blamed on spider bites that caused tissue death in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. Now, these were being blamed on the brown recluse. Problem was, the brown recluse doesn't live in the Pacific Northwest. Vest presented a correlation between cases of necrosis and the presence of Eratogena agrestis, the hobo spider, though the evidence was circumstantial. He went on to do actual testing of hobo spider bites on live rabbits, and those tests produced necrotic lesions. Now, despite the evidence being not quite solid, this made its way into medical literature, and we started seeing doctors diagnosing necrotic lesions as hobo spider bites. That led to the hobo spider being largely feared, but only in the US and Canada, which was weird since the hobo spider is native to Europe and has never been implicated in causing necrotic bites there. It didn't show up in North America until the 1930s. This went on for 15 years and many more scientific papers were published that talked about the hobo spider and its necrotic venom. Every one of them, though, simply pointed back to Vest's work, citing the studies he published. Nobody was really doing their own experiments. That is, until 2001, when Greta Binford tried to replicate Vest's experiments with rabbits, and couldn't produce necrotic lesions. She also compared North American hobo venom to European hobo venom and found no significant differences. Today, the CDC no longer lists the hobo spider as being medically significant. Now, one would expect that Darwin Vest would have something to say about this, right? Well, he couldn't respond. Why couldn't he respond? That's where it gets interesting. In June of 1999, after visiting an acquaintance in Idaho Falls, Vest left a bar alone, on foot, and was never seen again. A witness claimed they saw a body floating in the Snake River the morning after, and authorities theorized that Vest stumbled into the river and drowned, though they never searched the river. Vest's family, though, doesn't buy that, as the river wasn't even on his way home. Now, Vest had been assaulted and robbed two years earlier, and the man convicted for that had been enrolled in a local work release program just shortly before Vest disappeared, which Vest was never informed of. Now, the plot thickens when you learn that the last person seen with Vest was a man who lived right across from the nephew of the man Vest had testified against. So there's all kinds of uncertainty about what exactly happened to Darwin Kenneth Vest. And while he was declared legally dead in 2004, the case remains unsolved. The podcast Thin Air did a really great episode on this case that goes into the details, and I'll link that below. But at the time of his disappearance in 1999, it was largely accepted in North America that the hobo spider was dangerous and could cause necrosis. It wasn't until after his disappearance that more research was done and produced a much different picture of this spider and its venom. But how exactly that happened, and how we unraveled it, will be in the second part of this video. Along with more details of what you can expect from these spiders if they're living in your house, how they'll behave, and how they will or won't affect your life, the weird case of the barn funnel weaver's disappearance and reappearance in Patagonia, and of course, cheese tests, so we can see how much nonsense these spiders will or won't put up with. Which hopefully won't take me too long to put together, as most of the research is already done, so stay tuned for that in the coming weeks. If you liked this video, or found it helpful, give it a like, drop me a comment, hit subscribe, click the bell so you're notified when part 2 hits YouTube, and if you want to support this channel so I can keep doing the research and all the other work that goes into producing these videos, check out my Patreon page, where you'll get some extras. You can also check out my Shopify store and get one of these cool mugs. If you're looking for a good identification guide to spiders, you'll find an Amazon link below for Sarah Rose's Spiders of North America, which is excellent. I use it, and if you use that link, I do earn a small commission. This is a fantastic resource for anyone interested in spiders. Even though I'm only half done with these three, I hope you've learned something about these spiders in your house, and I hope to see you next time for part two. Cheers.